Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here, and we thank you for bringing us together with the greatest gift that you have ever given us, the gift of faith which is in our hearts. We gather recognizing that we sit in your presence. You said that when two or three are gathered in your name, you would be in our midst. Lord, we have gathered for no other reason than to be with you, to get to know you better, to love you more, to serve you in every way that our hearts were made to serve you. Lord, we pray especially for this time that it would be a time that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds to new ideas, to new fervor, to new zeal of serving you. We pray especially for all of the events that will take place this weekend, especially the Collar Cup tomorrow. We ask that it would be a success. We will measure that success, not by our own standards, but your standards, Lord. We ask that your grace would precede us, and that every work, action, and deed that we would accomplish would begin with that grace. And through your grace, you would bring it to a successful completion of your will. We ask your blessing upon us in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So exciting. I was, uh, I was asked to, to share a little bit about my personal testimony this morning and, and to share some ideas about, about what we have for, um, for preparing our youth to encounter the Lord, to know Him better, to come to know and love and serve Him. Uh, and and I, I just want to share some of those ideas. You know, and I think that the more that I, I work as a priest now, I just a couple weeks ago celebrated my third anniversary as a priest, and, uh, and, and now just working in this ministry of, of casting this net for souls and concentrating on others, uh, all of these ideas, it's, it's just constantly in my heart of, of how, to, how to be a fisher of men, right? How, how to do exactly what Jesus told the men from the very start, I will make you fishers of men. How do we get out there? How do we do that? And I think one of the greatest lessons that I've learned thus far, many lessons, but one of the greatest lessons I've learned thus far is that we have to become interpreters for the youth. We have to become interpreters. Let me explain what I mean by that. I'm a huge Chicago Bulls fan. Growing up in the state of Illinois, I watched the Chicago Bulls through six NBA championships in eight years. Grew up in the 90s. It was an amazing time. I know, what are you guys, uh, Sacramento Kings? Yeah, Golden State, probably somebody jumped on that bandwagon lately, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember watching you know, the Sacramento Kings back when Back when they were a little bit better, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lonnie Divots and Chris Weber and, and Peja Stojakovic and, and Jackson, all these guys. Great battles with the Bulls. But back in those days, Michael Jordan was my hero. Back, he, was, he was the idol of, of every kid in Illinois, no matter what sport you played. I was a soccer player. I loved basketball as well. But back in those days, I idolized Michael Jordan. And, and he's probably the only, the only player that I ever idolized throughout my entire life. And during that time, Michael Jordan, uh, he was drafted in 1984. He went to the Chicago Bulls, and for five years, he was, he was without argument, he was the best player in the, in the league. He was, he was the greatest individual contributor that anyone ha had seen thus far. They knew that he was may maybe the greatest player of all time, even in his first five years. For his first five years, as a player, he was on the All-Star team. He made the All-Star team for five straight years. In 1988... He won his first MVP. The following year, Phil Jackson was hired, 1989. In the year that Phil Jackson was hired, he looked at Michael Jordan, and he, he came to grips with him, and he had analyzed this throughout this time, because what did Michael Jordan lack? A championship. He didn't have it, right? He was the best individual player, but there was no one around him. In fact, Phil Jackson, interpreting Michael Jordan's career thus far, after five years, noticed that Michael Jordan didn't trust his teammates. He noticed that Michael Jordan always took the last shot. He, he didn't trust anybody else to take the shots in the game when, when, the, when the game was on the line. He noticed that Michael Jordan didn't hang out with his teammates, even on the social level, outside of the sport. Michael Jordan was famously known for traveling with his entourage as he went. He, he had, he had you know, these bodyguards, he had family, he had these friends that would travel with him, even on the road, and those were the guys that he hung out with. Right? He was an individual player, and he noticed that Phil Jackson saw all this stuff, and he said, this is the reason we're not winning. Phil Jackson famously came up with the triangle offense, if you ever heard that. He continued to play with that in the Lakers, by the way. He, he came up with this triangle offense. Inherently, there had, he, Michael, Jackson, Michael Jordan had to start working with the rest of the team. It was inherent to their system. Not only that, he convinced Michael Jordan to dump this entourage and start hanging out with his teammates, to start becoming social with them. 
off the court. He and Scotty Pippen started this, this workout regime. They convinced the team that they would be the best off the court team in the entire league, that they would work out harder than anyone else. And, and the reason that they did that was to convince the rest of the players that they were made for greatness. And at that time, Phil Jackson had convinced Michael Jordan that this team, if Michael Jordan could get it together and be a, the leader that he was called to be, because he saw that there was something in Michael Jordan that he wasn't using, his leadership ability, his social ability, that he could rally the troops, and that he could lead these guys to greatness, but he was trying to do it himself, and it wasn't working. And he had Michael Jordan convinced that he could do that. And so he and Scottie Pippen started to convince the rest of the players that they were the hardest working team in the NBA. They, they started to convince the rest of the players that they were the best team in the NBA. And what happened just two years after that? The first, in, the first NBA championship. The first of their first three-peat. For the next six years, or the next eight years, they would win six championships, back-to-back three-peats. The only times that they didn't win, of course, were the years that Michael Jordan retired for a year and a half before coming back. But nevertheless, what happened in those championships? In 1993, Chicago Bulls were playing the Phoenix Suns against Charles Barkley and the crew. And it came down, not, the Bulls were losing 98-96. to 96. Last play of the game, who's going to get the ball? Michael Jordan, of course, right? They come down the floor, the ball comes into John Paxson, who hits the three and wins the game. They call it the shot heard around the world that year. Michael Jordan had entrusted the ball to somebody else. He realized that all the attention was going to be on him, and he was going to be double teamed. They give the ball to John Paxson, who can make the shot. He finally trusted somebody enough to take the shot to win the championship, and that's what happened. The buzzer beater. 1997, Chicago Bulls are playing the Utah Jazz. Carl Malone, John Stockton, Hornacek. The year before Michael's next NBA champ, the last NBA championship. <clears throat> what do they do? You can actually YouTube this. Go on YouTube and watch. Watch Steve Kerr, the current coach of the Golden State Warriors. Watch Steve Kerr, and he comes out, and he speaks in this huddle, and you can hear him speaking in the huddle, and he says, when I come off the screen, I'm gonna be ready. Give me the ball. Steve Kerr, the end of the game. And what happens? It was all drawn up. Phil Jackson had drawn it up for Michael Jordan to trust Steve Kerr with the ball. They give the ball in to Michael Jordan. He's double teamed like everybody thought. The whole team converges upon him. What does he do? Kicks the ball out to Steve Kerr, who is a 15-foot jumper, to win the championship. Why do I tell you all this? Who was the key to their success? Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson was the person in Michael Jordan's life that could interpret life for him. Michael Jordan had enough information. What he needed was interpretation. And if we're looking at our diocese today, if we're looking at our vocations today, if we're looking at, at leading the youth, they need interpretation, not information. They don't need more information. We live in the information age. Whatever you can tell them, they've already found on Google. They've already found it. When you need a problem, if there was a projector or, or, or you know, problems with a microphone, I'd be asking one of these kids here to help me out. Not one of you, they, because they know better. They already have enough information. They don't need more information. They need interpretation. You have wisdom. Wisdom is the combination of experience and knowledge. You have experience and knowledge for the years that you've lived your life. This is what we need to give our youth. This is what we need to give other, uh, uh, other people who are trying to figure out. That's called discernment, right? We're trying to figure out life. You give them interpretation of your life. And I know that I've had great interpreters throughout my life. This is the only way that I've figured it out. And it's taken some time. But the first interpreters of my life were my parents. And I grew up in, in Central Illinois just like any other kid. And I didn't know, I didn't know how sports and faith were, were supposed to combine. As a youth, I stand here and I tell you that the sports were the, were, were the most important thing in my life. Even though our Lord says you should love me above all things, the first commandment, right? You should love me above, above all things with your whole mind, your whole heart, your whole soul, your, all your strength, right? All that was important to me was my sports. I watched every, well, as a family, we watched every single Bulls game. Every single one. That was the most important thing. We started this, this, this crazy thing called traveling soccer, right? And before we did that, I remember my parents uh, telling us, sitting my brother and I down. My brother Blaze is a, is a year and a half older than me. And, um, and so we were very close in age, and, and, and I remember when we were about to do this, my parents said, there's two things. There's two things that are non-negotiable here. If we're going to do this traveling soccer thing, right? two things that are non-negotiable. The first one is that our family will never be divided. We're going to be a united family. And that means, Chase, you have to make Blaze's teams, right? Good luck. 
which is probably one of the greatest blessings ever because I got to play up a year. I got to play with greater competition. I got to hone my skills with, with better players, right? Well, it happened. And the other thing is that we'll never, ever miss mass. I don't care where we travel. I don't care what we do. I don't care if we have to miss games or practices or whatever it is. We're not going to miss mass. So my brother and I, if that was the, if that was the case, what we had to do, that we, we agreed. That's what we're going to do. And that's what, that's what happened throughout my life. And this was the time before the internet. So mom and dad in the yellow pages in the middle of Ohio trying to look up where's a church, you know, within driving distance, right? And what times those churches are and making phone calls without cell phones, right? Trying to find which places those masks were, right? And at that time, my parents explained to me what was important in our lives. They were telling me at that time, they were interpreting life for me, telling me that this is the most important thing. We'd be running on the field on Sunday morning, you know, while all the rest of the team is warming up and but the game's about ready to start, the whistle's about to blow, and everybody's like, where's Blazing Chase? You know, our late mass. You know, and here we come, you know, ashamed to be running on that field, but nevertheless, we had to do what we had to do. And everybody just, just knew that. On Saturday nights, when everybody else was going out to dinner, we're Blazing Chase, where, where's, where, where are the Hilgenbrinks? Our late mass, yeah. We were mass because we had games the next morning, right? So there's always a time, you can always work it out, you can always figure it out. This is, and it was the bane of my existence. I hated it. And that's what made me dislike my faith because I was, I was ashamed of it at times, you know? Why is this taking precedence? And, and no one else is doing this. Why, are I, why, why am I doing it? But at that time, I tell you, that, that set something inside of me. I knew something because I loved and respected my parents. Even though I didn't tell them that much at those ages, I did secretly love and respect them for everything that they did for us. And I, and I knew that they were doing all of this because it was the most important thing in our life, or in, at least in their life. And we would pray while we were in the car, you know? We, we would always pray together as a family whenever we traveled. It was always, it was always something that was the first thing you do when you get in the car. Nevertheless, those things had an impression on me because when I was in high school, I had, I had a storm of things happen to me, especially in, in athletics. It, everything blew up. I was here in California almost once a month, uh, having made the, the under-17 U.S. national team. Uh, we trained in Chula Vista at the Olympic Training Center in, in, in Southern California, there in San Diego. And and I thought, wow, this, this is exactly what I've always wanted. I've always wanted to be an athlete. You know, the only thing in my mind is, is to be an athlete. And at that time, I didn't know I was going to be a professional athlete, but certainly it was, some, it was something I had dreamed about. And then all of a sudden, the next year, I became an All-American in high school. I had all of these things. The, the world was opening up, and I had all these schools calling me, wanting to recruit me to play at, at, at these universities. I thought, this is it. You know, sports are, this is everything. There's nothing else in the world besides sports. There's nothing. You know, this is the only thing. I'm not saying I didn't have faith, I did. Thanks be to God. But this was the most important thing to me. That was, that was everything to me. And I'll say that there were some bad interpretations of life that I received as well. Right? When I finally committed to Clemson University in South Carolina, I went there. And this is, this is across the board in all Division I programs, and, and, and maybe Division II and Division III, I don't know, I haven't experienced that, but in, at least in Division I programs in every single sport, I realized and I was told from the very beginning that this team is, is, is everything to you. This is number one. This comes before everything else in your life. This team. This is why you're here. You know, a scholarship athlete, paid to play the game. You're here. Your sport is number one. This, this fraternity, this family, everything. At times that came before faith. That came before studies. That came before everything else. Having said that, I give my, my college coach credit, Trevor Dare. What a, what a great example, great man. He was, for me, a man who, who, who taught us how important our studies were. He taught us that, that we couldn't be good athletes, and, and he interpreted that for us. He, he was interpreting that this, this has to be important to you in your life. You are a student athlete, right? And, and he always allowed me to practice my faith, right? But that was the time I was wondering what, what my life was all about. And I got to college, and, and as every, every college student does, the reason that we love college so much is because we have emancipation for the first time. We are away from our families. We are independent. We are going to become the man that we want to be. Not the man that you've made me to be. And I was so excited that every Sunday morning there was no one tapping me on the shoulder or throwing my co covers off to, to, to wake up to get to church. I didn't have to anymore. It felt strange. It felt so weird to me. And while everyone else was not going to Mass, was not going to church, was finally done with church, even if they went in high school, there was something inside of me. There was something inside of me that said I, I couldn't give this up. I had to at least go give it a try. I had to at least go go see what you know what, what mass was like on campus. Yeah. 
Uh, a lot of people tell me that I have a lot of courage for, for continuing to go to Mass in college when no one else was doing that. And that's, that's probably maybe one of the reasons, right? I wanted to be independent. I wanted to be my own man. Well, no one was going to church. Maybe my own man. I, I was doing something that no one else was doing. And so I started going to Mass on campus. And I thought, before I dump this, I, I better give it a try. Knowing that, if this was so important to my family, my parents, what it was to be a Hilgen Brink, which I was proud of, this was so important to them. And even though I don't understand exactly what's going on right now, maybe it's going to be important to me at some point in my life. I knew that. I started to go there. What happened to me is that I started to go to Mass, and I actually listened to the priest for the very first time in my life. I don't think in my childhood I ever listened to those homilies. They were terrible. <laughs> I was like, what am I getting out of this? What am I getting out of Mass? And I started to listen to those prayers, all those prayers that we just know by memory, that we just spout off. Every Mass, we don't even think about what we're doing. We're actually thinking about what we're going to eat after Mass while we're saying the Creed, right? Whatever it is, there's, there's, it's, there's always something different. I started to listen to those prayers, and I thought, wow, this is really what we believe. Do I believe this? And, and, and I started to pray those prayers for the first time. I started to listen to the readings, and I thought, wow, these scriptures are actually a little bit interesting. There's some cool stories in here. Jesus was actually starting to speak into some of my experiences of life. I thought, this isn't half bad. And the more that I listen, the more that Jesus drew me in. And I tell people that this is, this is the most important, and there, I made the most important decision of my entire life to this day, more than being a priest. The most important decision I ever made in my entire life was that freshman year of college when I, just, when I decided for myself that I was going to be a Christian, that I was going to be a Catholic, and I was going to be a practicing member of the Catholic Church for the rest of my life. It wasn't because I was pious. It wasn't because I knew what I was doing. It was because I, I, I had inherited a faith that I hadn't made my own. And now I was choosing for the very first time as a man to practice this faith, that it was important to me. And that would serve me well. You know, throughout my time in college, you know, there's always these, these retreats. If you ever hang out at the Newman Center, there's always these retreats that they, they try to get you to go on. And I was like, you know, I'm not falling for that. I'll, I'll go to Mass. I'll check the box each week because that's what it means to be a good Catholic, go to Mass, right? And so I, I, would, I, I went to, to Mass each week, and then, you know, as, as an athlete, I started bringing athletes with me. Um, and and other, other Catholic guys would, would come to Mass, you know, if you, if you go, somebody else would go. And so I was going with other, other soccer players, and, and uh, we would go to Mass, and people would start recognizing us. And, and so I remember throughout, there was, always, there was always people asking us to go on retreat. And I thought, you know, I'm going to Mass, but I'm not hanging out with the Holy Rollers, you know. I'm not going that far. I was never interested too much in youth group growing up. Never was part of a youth group. That's too, that's too much for me. Like, I have my own group, and it's called my team, and that's, that's the only fraternity I need, and I got my family, but uh, no, no Holy Rolling. And, uh, and so finally, there was, I remember there was a girl that, was, that started to ask me each year to go on these retreats, and I thought that she had something for me, and... You know, just kind of strange, and I, it wasn't really reciprocal, and she was really strong and really, like, forward in, in the way that she spoke, and really kind of the one at the Newman Center that just rallied people, you know, and, and got people going, and I thought, this is really strange, and it just, you know, I just, and so finally, I always would give an excuse every year, well, I can't, I, I play soccer, and I, I can't take a day off of that, I can't, I'm not asking my coach to, to leave for a retreat, that's, that's extracurricular, you know, that's like taking a vacation from the sport, and I don't, I don't, I don't do that, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this game, right? Finally, my senior year, in the spring of my senior year, season was over, and here she comes again. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, what am I going to say now? I've, I'm all out of excuses, I've been saying this for four years, that I can't go on retreat because of soccer, and she's like, you don't have soccer anymore. She's like, you have to go on this retreat. So finally, I was like, yeah, what else am I going to do? All right, I'll go. So I go on this retreat. While we were on this retreat, um, the priest had us all sit in a circle. And the, the, whole, the whole point of, of, of this exercise was to show how God really has something to say to you personally. It was beautiful, right? And so we read the scripture. We read Matthew chapter 4. I didn't know anything about Matthew chapter 4 then. I know it now because I, I remember what he read. Matthew chapter 4, and he read this thing, and he says, we're going to go around here. Everybody's going to listen to these scriptures. And when we're done, each person is going to reveal a word, a phrase, something that resonated with you, something that spoke to you during this time, right? And so we went around the circle, and, and I remember just laughing because I was like, I was trying to make it fun and make a joke out of the whole thing. And, and it finally came to me, and it, coming around the circle, and, and I said, um, I said, fishers of men. So isn't that interesting, you know, like, Jesus, Jesus play on words, right? Jesus is funny. I like, I like his humor, you know? You guys are fishermen, I'm going to make you fishers of men, right? And I made a joke about it that was 
probably not even appropriate, and, uh, and, and I, we just moved on. And someone actually told me afterwards, you know, actually this, Chase, this is the time where Jesus called his first priest. And in fact, it's the place where he called his first pope, you know, the first bishops of the church. This is, this is what he was doing. It wasn't, it wasn't just a play on words. He was, he was using their talents and abilities and what they were good at, and he was going to in, interpret life for them, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you that you can be good at what I'm asking you to do. Right? I thought, well, great. That's, that's really interesting. Thanks for the information. No thought in my mind. No thought in my mind of priesthood. So at the end of this retreat, we're, we're getting ready to leave, and, and there was this, this girl that you know, was on the retreat, and the whole time, you know, it was just kind of awkward. I thought that at any time she was going to ask me out, which in my machismo, I'm the man. I would ask somebody out if I wanted to go out with you, right? I don't want a girl asking me out. You know? and, uh, and so I just feel, felt weird. I thought at any time, this was in my mind all, all weekend, like she's going to like come on to me. She's going to ask me out. It's going to be weird. I don't know what to say, you know? And so at the end of this retreat, I'm out in the car, and I'm getting stuff packed up, putting stuff in the trunk, and me and another guy. And then I look across the parking lot, and we met eyes. There she is, across the parking lot. And, she's, and she starts making a beeline for me. I'm like, oh my gosh. This is like a replay of you asking me to the retreat, now you're going to ask me out or something, you know? And so she comes, and, she's, she, and I'm trying to think, I'm trying to pack up quick, and you know, and, and she comes in, so, uh, hey, we started talking, and, and, and as we talk, she finally says to me, she says, Chase, you know, I really think that you would be a great priest one day. And my ego went, Shh. All this time thinking she's going to ask me out, she tells me to be a priest. <laughs> and again, I said, yeah, whatever, okay, thank you. You know, I was like, that's better than you asking me out. In fact, if that was a pickup line, that was your worst pickup line ever, right? You have to work on that one. And so I was, I was out of there. No thought in my mind, you know, and I was, I was gone from that place. But nevertheless, that would, that would, that would remain in my heart, and I, I knew that, that something was happening to me at that time. Just two months after I graduated, so just a few months after that, two months after, after I graduated, I had the opportunity to sign my first professional contract. I went down to South America, and uh, I, I went to try out for a team in, in the country of Chile. And as I got there, I was so excited. I was, I was ready to live my dream. I was ready. This was the time. The Lord had blessed me in college with, with great opportunities on the field. Um, I, was, I was starting to become the man that, that, that I thought I was made to be. And here was just another step. Like, God was confirming this whole time that I was made to be an athlete. I was made for this. I was made to be a professional soccer player. That's what, that's what God made me to be. And I go down to this country, and, and the very first thing that I recognize is that everything's unfamiliar. Everything. I didn't know anything. Everything in my life had changed. Culture, customs, language. I didn't know how to get on the bus to get downtown. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to, how to buy bread. You know, they make bread every, every, every morning. Fresh bread. Corner store. Who would have thought? It was amazing. <laughs> but how do you do this? How does, how does life work? Like, we don't do that. I buy bags of bread. Where's the bag of bread? And where's the peanut butter? No peanut butter in Chile. You know that? Amazing. They don't eat peanut butter. No syrup. No, no pancake. No. And so everything was different for me. But I tell you, there's two things, I, and, and this, is, this is a lesson, right? This is the lesson of what we're doing now. We are, we are training the youth. We are training ourselves, our families, for the rest of their life. Because what happens in human nature is that in human nature, when we find ourselves in troubled spots, or we don't know what else to do, we fall back on what we know. We will only fall back on what we know. In theology, Father Jovita will know, we, you, can only, you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have it, you can't give it. You, don't have, you, you have to know. And the only two things that I knew in that country, there were only two things that were universal and they were never changed in the entire world. The first one was, was soccer. You know, I, I felt comfortable. I didn't have to speak the language and I was getting on in the field. It was amazing. It's beautiful. I only worked two hours a day. What do I do with 22 hours? I worked for two hours a day. So what I did... I found my home right there on the field. I would, I would arrive an hour early. I would stay an hour late. Now I played for four hours a day. It was just what I knew. It was the only thing that I could fall back on. And everybody thought, what a good professional. They didn't know that I was just lonely. And after that, I would go after practice. The other thing that will never change, that, that, that doesn't change throughout the entire world, no matter where you go, just like soccer, the rules don't change. You know it. It's the Catholic Church. You can go to any 
any country in the entire world, and the Catholic Church is the same. You don't have to understand the language of the Mass, and you know exactly when to kneel and when to stand and when to sit. You know when they're doing the penitential rite, even if you don't understand, Señor, that be that. You know that, that the Eucharist is becoming the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, no matter if you understand it or not. They can be speaking in Russian, and you know what's happening in that church. And here again, I felt at home. Later, I would be able to explain it theologically after I went to seminary, but at that time, I, didn't, I had no explanation for why I felt at home being united to Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, thinking about my family being at the same place halfway across the world. Of what it means to be united as one body of Christ. And there, was, there, was, there I, found, I found my other home. And so almost every day, those, those are the things that I did. I would go and sit in a church in the middle of the Chilean winter, Mediterranean climate, torrential downpour for three months straight, sitting in an unheated church with my coat on. And I remember one of those days, sitting before our Lord, believing in Jesus Christ, present in the Eucharist, feeling lonely in those first six months that I was living there, and asking the Lord for comfort. The Lord, just bring comfort to my life. Help me to live the dream that I've always wanted. Help me to live this dream of Michael Jordan. Help me to win championships, the MVP trophies. Help me to you know, make a lot of money. You know, great parties, beautiful women. Whatever. I want it all. And as I sat there praying for comfort, I just heard these words in the, in the depths of my heart. Loud words. I never heard with my ears, but only with my heart. Just said, be my priest. And that was terribly uncomfortable. I was praying for comfort, and he didn't give me comfort. <laughs> be my priest. That was, I said, Lord, that's, that's the last thing that I would want to do. And I immediately said, no. If the Lord was asking, my answer was no. I didn't want that. I wanted more friends. I wanted, I wanted to be a starter on the team. I wanted, I wanted a contract. I wanted, I wanted a girlfriend. I wanted, I wanted interpretation of life. I wanted to understand how this world worked. At that time, I started asking huge questions in my life. Why am I here? Why am I on earth at all? Why am I a Christian again? Why am I Catholic? Why should I be anything? Why? And all those questions have answers. And I, I began to answer, answer those things. Well, in the next couple months, my life did change. And I did start dating a great girl. And I was a starter on my team. I played more minutes that season than anybody else in the entire team. I, I had more friends than, than I knew what to do with. I had less time in my day than, than I ever had before. I was, I was asking for time by myself after that. I was invited everywhere. I was doing everything that I ever wanted. And it was great. And I began to love it. At the same time, that call to that priesthood, it never goes away. I thought if I could just fall in love with this girl, the Lord would, would forget about the, the original offer. It doesn't work. <laughs> when he asks, he doesn't take it back. He doesn't forget. He doesn't make mistakes, you know? We often think he'll change his mind. You know, if, you're, if he's asking you of something, you, know, you think that you're going to change his mind. He's infallible. That's exactly what happened every single day. Every single day, this, 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 this call to the priesthood was, was alive in my heart. Every single day. And it only grew more. And I played for about two and a half more years after that, continuing to, to run away, continuing to, to make my own decisions, to, to make my own life, grasping at, at everything that I thought would bring me comfort, grasping at everything I thought would make me more of a man. And for better or for worse, um, all of that stuff led to dissatisfaction in my heart. And everything that I lived up until to that point, it got to the point that uh, in 2006 we won what is called the Promotion. We won basically a, a national championship that, that brought us into the first division. And I remember that week, if, if you've ever seen the videos you know, of, of South American soccer, or European soccer, just how crazy it is. Crazy. I left that field almost stripped. The fans were on the field taking off my shin guards. There's, I saw a kid running through the, the, the streets with my shoes, you know. This, everything was gone, you know. It was, it was wild. They were hoisting us up and throwing us everywhere. There were parades. There were parties. There were everything for a week straight. The people got off a, a day of work. The whole city. The whole city took a day off of work to party. This was the biggest thing that had happened to the town in, in, in decades. It was amazing. And during that week, we were invited everywhere, to every party, to anybody who was important, had the team to their place, to their restaurant, to their offices, to whatever. And it was amazing. And I, that week I remember feeling, this, this is it. This is everything that I ever wanted. And the last night of that week, after the parties were all over, I remember sitting up late night in my, in my bed, just thanking the Lord. Lord, humanly speaking, this, this, is, 
And I consciously thought this. Humanly speaking, I was as happy as I've ever been in my life. You know, the very moment, in a moment of grace, I recognized that there was something still missing in my heart. I was saying, this is it. This is it. At the same time saying, this is it. That's all. 25 years old. Accomplished everything that I've ever wanted. Don't get me wrong. I would have still liked to play for Manchester United or Real Madrid or something. <laughs> and made many more millions so that I could help out the Diocese of Sacramento. But <laughs> nevertheless, I was saying, this is it. This is it. 25 years old and what? I, I think I have a few more years to live. I think there's, there's a lot of life to live here. I have no more plans. Zero. That was my only plan. Soccer was everything. Sports were everything. What else is there? I, that, the answer was, I don't know. Except for this thing that Jesus is asking me to do. This thing that Jesus said that won't go away in my heart. At the very same place where I'm being unsatisfied and feeling asked to do something else, to be a priest. And at that moment, I realized, someday, someday this will happen, someday. I had at least seven more years to play, at least, at least. My dad sent me a book by Dr. Scott Hahn, for those of you who know Dr. Scott Hahn. There's a book that he wrote called Rome Sweet Home. And in this book, it's, it's a story of his conversion from being a, a, a Presbyterian pastor uh, to becoming a Catholic and, and how that occurred. And as I read his story, I was sitting there uh, in my house with all kinds of time on my hands, right? I'm reading, this, I'm reading this book, and it's the story of him and his wife, Kim, and they're, they're, they're starting to, to make the decision to become Catholics. And they know that God is asking this of them, but they just don't want to do it yet, right? And it was like me saying, yes, I will be a priest, Lord, probably in like seven to ten years. If you, if you check back with me, I'll be ready, right? Just check back. I, I will do it, right? And they're, they're going through this dialogue, and, 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 and Dr. Han comes home to his wife, Kimberly, who's making dinner, and, and, and you women, you have the sixth sense. I don't know how it works, but you do. And he walks in the house, and she sees the look on his face, and she says, don't say it. And he says, what are you talking about? And of course, he had been going to daily mass every single day without her knowing. And she says, don't say it. And she says, you said, we know that we'll become Catholics one day, but you said that we're going to give it a few years. I know that you want to do it right now. And then he said these words to her that I knew were the Lord's words to me. They jumped off that page and straight into my heart, and I knew the Lord was speaking. And he says to his wife, delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. That every moment, that every moment we say, later, those of you who are mothers and fathers, later means no. Every, every moment that I said later to the Lord, I was really saying, no, Lord. No, Lord, not today. No, not today. Your will be done, but not today. Not with me. And I recognized right there that I, and I, the Lord had graced me over these, this three-year period, and I knew that he had changed my heart. All these obstacles that I had put up in the very beginning, I had, I had tons of reasons why not to become a priest. You could probably imagine what they all are. I could name them. I recognize I, I, I had some some thought at that time. And I realized the Lord had absolutely changed my heart. I had no reason why not to become a priest at that time. There was nothing. He cleared out everything. He cleared every obstacle in my heart to saying yes to Him. And that's when I realized I had to call my agent and, and get back to the states. And at that time, I was so fearful. I was so embarrassed to even be called to be a priest. I had not told anyone that I was even discerning this. Not told my parents, who would be the first ones to know. I had not told any friends, my girlfriends. Of course did not know. None of my teammates, no one. Not even a priest. I would not even speak. And I had some pre, a priest friend who was a great fan of the team who would often have me over lunch, for lunch because he, he saw me at Mass. I wouldn't even tell him. And um, so I just told my agent, hey, I need to get back to the States. It's time in my career. It's time for me to get back. I came back after having several offers uh, that December going into January. Um, Finally prayed about it, talked with the family about it, and uh, I had decided to, to sign with Colorado Rapids. I thought that was the best place for me uh, in the MLS to play until, uh, until August. God willing, I would be accepted as a seminarian because I had just started the process, didn't know how that was going to go. And so I, you know, they had sent us through, if you know any seminarian, you'll know how grueling this, this process is, this, this torture that Father Jovito puts his seminarians through. <laughs> 
they send you to they send you to do you know seven hours of mental exams to make sure you're not crazy, right? If you want to be crazy, you're not crazy. You have these tests, these exams, these you know to figure out intellectual capacity. Uh, you meet with psychologists. You meet with the chancellor of the diocese to do an interview. You you do 18 pages of, of autobiography, tell everything about your life, answer questions that they want to know about your life, everything you've done. You have fingerprints with 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 the police and the FBI and every all of this stuff. It just goes on and on. It seems like every week they're calling you for something else. You got to do this. You got to do that. I'm like, man, this is it's it's harder to be a at seminary than it is to be an FBI agent. You know, like, <laughs> this is some real screening going on, and for good cause, right? Nevertheless, um, I went. I went to Colorado, not knowing anything about my future in the seminary. And I went there. I had, a, had an unbelievable experience. I had some cousins living in the city, so I moved in with my cousin who was living downtown, this apartment, and I just moved in with him until I was able to to get, you know, get established and and, and find my own place. And for those for that first month, we went we went to preseason. So we spent two weeks in Miami with other MLS teams, and, and we were doing some preseason games and some training. And we came back. We were just getting ready to go to, to Europe to, to finish off our preseason to play with Arsenal in England. Um, and just before that, the, the coach and the general manager called me into the office before training one day. We were back in Denver, and um, you know, for anybody who gets called in the office with the with the bishop or the general manager and, and, and the head coach or the principal, um, it's not usually to tell you that they're proud of what you've done. Right? Um, and so they proceeded to tell me that we're just a couple weeks away from the season now and we're over the salary cap. We still need to sign a goal scorer and, and we're basically paying you too much money. Your, your salary is expendable. And that day I was released from the team. And I don't, I don't, I've never been cut from a team in my life. I thought, why now? I've experienced all this success in South America. I came back, signed this great contract, I'm ready to go. And I just, my stomach dropped as soon as I realized I have not, I don't have a job, I'm no longer playing soccer, and I've not been accepted to the seminary. I'm not even going to be a priest. I'm like, Lord, why are you leaving me hanging? All this time, all I've been trying to do is follow you. I came back, and, and now this. Like, I, I couldn't make sense out of it. In fact, I left all of my locker there that day. I couldn't even, I couldn't even look at the guys. I thought, I'll, you know, I'll come back and get my stuff you know, another day. I left the locker room that day. I drove back to my cousin's apartment in downtown Denver. And you know, I went up. He was at work. And I, I went up to the, the balcony. And I was looking out the balcony of this high rise. I looked over Denver. And I'm just lamenting. I couldn't talk to anybody. I didn't know what to do. And so I see these steeples out there. I'm like, yes, Lord, I'll come. You know? Go back to what I know. Fall back on what you know. And so I go. And I walk to this church in downtown Denver. And I get there. Middle of the day, it was like noon, doors locked, can't get in. It's like, it's about par for the course for today, huh? can't even get into the church. And I see another steeple, you know, a couple blocks down, and I just, I'll keep going, you know? nothing else to do. So I kept walking down that street that day, pulling into this church called St. Joseph's downtown, and I, I, I recognized that there was a Hispanic community around the, the church. I walk in to the vestibule, I opened up the doors, dark, no one there, silence, quiet. Couldn't have been much wider. The chapel couldn't have been much wider than the room that we stand in right now. And I opened up the doors of that church. In the darkness and the silence, there was a banner that hung from one side of the church to the other over all the pews right there in the, in the sanctuary. And in Spanish, it read, Ahora serás pescador de hombres. Had I not spent four years in Chile, I would have had no idea what that sign said. But I had no idea. Because I did, I fell straight to my knees. This, the English translation of Ahora serás pescador de hombres is, and now I will make you a fisher of men. And I knew that the Lord was calling me. I knew that the Lord had a plan. I knew that the Lord was, was fulfilling his plan right, right there. Right there and then, from the very beginning, from that retreat, from the time that he started calling me. Through, through all of that, in interpreting life and realizing what was important to me, recognizing that even my dreams, even the things that I had planned for myself, everything that I had planned for my own life could never compare to the plans of the Lord. That everything that I had planned for myself would never fulfill me. It was only following the Lord's plan, only answering His voice, answering His call would bring that fulfillment. So I called my parents. Finally, I had the courage to call somebody. As I'm walking home, I was, I was, I was calling and I, I said, hey, you guys are never going to believe this. First of all, I was released from the team. I was lamenting myself. I was still pitying myself. 
I said I was released from the team and I said, I, you know, I just, and not being accepted, I said, I'm, I'm in a little bit of distress, but I did go to church today and I, I you know, the Lord, the Lord's going to take, I know he's going to make sense out of this. So we talked for a while and, and, um, and of course, uh, you know, there were great, great consolation at that time. Um, and my mom says, well, there's been a lot of, you know, there's some mail here for you or whatever, and there's something from the diocese. I said, well, open it up. It's probably another exam that I have to take. It's probably like, they probably want to know why I was released from the team or something. They probably already heard, you know. I have to, you know, go through some more scrutiny. And so my mom opens it up. And it was a letter from Bishop Jenke, my bishop in the Diocese of Peoria, saying today you have been accepted as a seminary in the Diocese of Peoria. The very, the very time that I needed good news, the very time, the Lord in His providence had taken care of all things. And this is the reality, and, and of course, I, I could tell more of the story. Um, it goes on and on and on. And if you have questions afterwards, I, I will continue to go, but just when the door closed, my father, interpreting life with me, gave me great fatherly advice. He said, sometimes doors close because the Lord does not want you to walk through them, and sometimes the doors open back up because He wants you to go through a different door. And long story short, I was called in the next couple of weeks by my agent and, um, and was asked to go to the New England Revolution, uh, where I signed, where I played out the rest of, of, my, of my time in the MLS before, before retiring on, on July 15th, just one month, almost exactly to the day in which I would step foot to the seminary. Um, and, and what an amazing process, what, a, what an amazing thing to stand before you right now telling that story. Uh, of how God has, has worked marvels in my life, of revealing truly what my heart was made for, revealing who I am. And, and this is the greatest thing that, that I've ever done with my entire life. And, um, and I know that, that maybe there's some, some practical advice after I finish my story, there's some practical advice of, of what I would say to you as, as youth leaders, as parents, um, of, of how, to, how to incorporate vocations in your life. And you heard something about my parents, and, and, um, and I would say it all starts there. Our church calls the family the domestic church. You are the domestic church. It's the very first church that you're involved in is, is, is the family. And you see from my story that everything that happened in the home went with me throughout my entire life. You can send your kids to Catholic schools all you want. You, you guys know this. I'm preaching to the choir here. We can send our kids to Catholic school all we want. If, you, if we don't take those kids to Mass on weekends, if we don't pray with them at home, then you might as well just throw your money somewhere else. Because they're going to do what you do. They're going to become who you are. No matter what you, somebody tells them for a couple hours a day, the teachers who they don't respect anyway, because they're telling them of some other world that they don't understand because they don't live it at home. If we're not living it in our families, if we're not building up family life, why do you think that our church is on the front, uh, uh, on the front spectrum of every political thing that goes on with the family in our country. It's because we fight for that family. We fight because that's the foundation of our church. Family is the foundation of all society. And so if we're not living it, what do we expect? Do we expect priests to come out of homes where they never knew Jesus and never prayed and, and, and never went to church? Do we expect? It happens. The Lord works miracles. I'll tell you that. It happens. But those who are built up with virtue and with faith and, and know these things from the very beginning have a much better opportunity. Do you know that there's been a survey done, and I'll recommend this book to you, there's been a survey done of all priests across the United States that 53% of all priests say that between the ages of 13 and 18 were the first thoughts about priesthood when they're in the home. And when someone has asked them about being a priest, someone says, you know, I think you should think about being a priest. Or some girl comes to you when you're 18 years old, and you're 21 years old, and says to you, I think you'd be a great priest. Or I remember back in my fifth grade teacher, my math teacher, coming up to me, which she does not remember to this day, telling me randomly as she's walking by my desk, I think you would be a great priest one day. Fifth grade, right? Those things stick with you. That's, that's, that, that's the family in which we live. And that being reinforced in the family, it has to happen in the family. It has to happen there. Um, we have to reclaim family meals. Get rid of the cell phones, turn off the TV, eat dinner with your family. It's a sacred time, it's a sacred place. If you don't sit down and eat dinner with, with your family, when, when else do you talk? Don't tell me that everybody comes back to the table at 8 p.m. or at 9 p.m. just to have a conversation over cookies. It doesn't happen. No one does that. If not, if not at the mealtime, 
then we're not in communication with our families, maybe with your children. If you think you know what's going on in their life, turn everything off. I remember my dad turned off Bulls games. Sacrilege. Turn off Bulls games when Michael Jordan is playing so that he can talk. Are you kidding me? With the fights that would happen with my brother and I and my parents when they turned off the TV. That was the time to talk. And they wanted to know what went on in your day. They wanted to know who, who said what at school. What parents or what, 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 uh, what teachers are you not getting along with? Or what teachers said this? What did they do? And they want to know details. They want to know what's going on in our lives. I knew that they were interested in my life. Looking back on that, as I interpret that, right? I knew that they were interested in my life. I didn't know why they wanted to know all the details. But I knew that they were interested in my daily life. We talked about things, you know? Here's something. How many of our parents have told their children how they met, how they fell in love, and when they got married? Do they know your story? Do they know that they come as a product of a miracle of two people who otherwise shouldn't have found each other on this earth and did? And they are the result of that, of that relationship coming together? Do they know that? Do they know that, that they are, are made in God's providence? That the chance that you of meeting your husband or you meeting your wife at, at, at some retreat or at some party or at some random acquaintance of, of a, a friend of a friend of a friend who introduced you to a friend and that became your spouse? Do you know in that, how much providence goes into that? How much God has, 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 has deigned that relationship to bring them into the world? And yet they think that they're a mistake. Yet they think that they don't belong here and, they don't have, and life doesn't have meaning. And how could God have a plan for my life? What if we started just telling our stories to our kids about things that have happened to your life and why they're here? How it came about? What amazing stories that you have to share just about your life. Just, just talk about your life. Regain that sacred time at family meals. How about this? One of the things that I urge us to do is pray. There's so much, so much power in prayer. And it's not our power, it's the Lord's power. We know that, right? My parents, God bless them. I don't mean to canonize them today. But they did a lot of things that I respect. And it's my only context, right? If, you, if someone else was my parents, I'd probably have other things that, to tell you today what they did, right? But I don't. I just have mine. And I'm happy, right? And so one of the things that they did is that they started praying for my brother and I, Blaze, our spouses, when we were in diapers. And it wasn't just then. It just wasn't just when we were babies. They started praying for our spouses, our future, for, our, for God's providence to be at work in our life. And I know that Krista, my brother's wife, and that this church, all of you, are a result of my parents' prayers of finding God's will, of finding our spouses. So much so that when I grew up, 12, 13, junior high, in high school, every time, when I was in college and would come back from Mass, after every single Mass on Sundays, how did we end Mass? Our parents would take us over to the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary and pray for our spouses. We prayed for many things, but the, always the final prayer was the prayer for Blaze and Chase's spouses. And when you're in high school, that's just uncomfortable. <laughs> But nevertheless, I knew that that was important. I knew that interpreting life, that if my parents were praying for this, and it was that important for them to pray for this on a daily basis, that this should be important to me. Understand? It wasn't explicit. It was just watching the example. It was, it was seeing it. And I remember after Blaze got engaged to Krista, our family went back to the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's where we gave thanks. We gave thanks for God's will being done in his life of bringing this amazing woman my mom, of course, praying for, for beautiful, holy, pure Catholic women, for both of us. And it didn't happen. Blaze got a beautiful, pure, holy, non-Catholic woman who became Catholic the next year. And brought one into the church. What's better than that? It was in God's providence. It all worked out exactly how it was meant to be. When I didn't know how to tell my parents I was going to, be a, going to become a priest, right that year that I came back, to the United States, and I was just getting set to go out to Colorado. Just weeks before that, I came home and I thought, they should probably know now. This is going to happen anytime, they should probably know. And it wasn't to ask for their opinion, it was to tell them I'm leaving. Okay? Bad discernment. I, thought, I can talk about discernment later, but nevertheless, I didn't know what to do. What do you tell your parents that you're, you know, do you sit them down on the couch? Do you, have, do you say it over lunch or dinner? Or do you, you know, do you have a beer? I don't know. I didn't know what to do. And so the only thing in my mind was, Blessed Virgin Mary. So I called up a priest and was like, hey, can, you, can I come into the church tonight? And, and so I met, I met my family 
right there in the dark of the church with the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary with lights on her. And I had the family in there and sat them down and I said, you've prayed for, for my spouse for my entire life. And my mom and her fear thinking that I was going to move back to Chile with this girlfriend. <laughs> and I, that's where I told them that I, I believe the Lord was calling me to be a priest and I was, I was returning. I was going, going to leave soccer and enter into the seminary. Pray for spouses of your children. Pray for them unceasingly. St. Monica, pray for them to come back. Pray, that, pray that, that God's providence would be done in their life at all times. Just pray for them. Don't force them. No force. You can't force people. God made us with free will. You have 18 years where you can force them. 18 years while they're in your home where you can form them, right? Not force, but form them. Teach them to love God. I knew that my parents would accept it. And people ask me all the time, did you, what did your parents say when you told me you were going to be a priest? I said, well, I, I had fear because I knew that it was unknown. I knew that it would catch everybody by surprise because I never talked about it. I never wanted to talk about it. But I knew that they would accept it. Because why? Because my parents always taught me to do God's will. Whatever God's will be done, Chase, you know? He's always going to take care of you. He's always going to, to, to be there. He's always, whatever you do, just follow God's will, and, and, it, and that's, that's what has to be done. Right? So them teaching me that, I knew that God's will was going to be done. I knew that they would, I knew that they would accept that because I was telling them, I've, this isn't my idea. I guarantee you it's not my idea. If I had my own idea, I wouldn't be here right now. But this is God's will. God's will being done, so we can't force. They all have their own free will. But we have to live it. Another, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with just a couple stories, but men have to be men. Men have to step up. For men, for the men in our society to, to, to step up and to be good priests and to think that we can be good men and have good human formation, men have to be men to their children. Men have to show that example. You read any book on manhood, on formation of young men, Boys always follow their father's footsteps. They always do. Whether they practice their faith, you can read the studies. It's all whether the father practices the faith. Good human formation comes from the father. It has to. And we, as children, as young men, we look to our fathers as they're some kind of superhero. We believe they're Superman. And do you know what it does to a young boy when he sees super, Superman get down on his knees and adore a Lord, adore our God, it means that he knows that there's something bigger than his father. There is something in this universe that is, that is much bigger than him. There's something bigger than Superman here. No more machismo, no more standing outside of the church while, while, while mother and children are inside. No more, no more of that crap. Men must be the example for their sons. Men, we, we have to build up men. We can't, we can't talk bad to men or talk them out of this. Talk, no, bring them back. If we want to become the men that we're called to be, we have to be following God's will and knowing God's will for our life. We have to hear His voice. Otherwise, there's no manhood. We don't, we don't become the men that we're called to be. We don't become true men. Final story about, about prayer. Continue to pray. I'll show you this book. For anybody who's doing parish ministry, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. It's called A Hundredfold. It's by Rhonda Grunewald. Rhonda came to our diocese. We had an entire thing of all of our priests in our diocese about this book, A Hundredfold. If you want to start a vocations ministry in your parish, it's done. Buy the book and, and just step by step, she'll tell you what events to do, how to do them. Tons of ideas. Hundreds, hundreds of ideas. No pun intended, but hundreds of ideas in this book about what you can do to build vocations, a culture of vocations, because that's what it takes, a culture of vocations. Right? Tons of ideas. You know, we have, in our diocese, we do these playing cards, you know? They're like trading cards for kids. Every school in the diocese has trading cards. And the kids will say, I'll trade you a Chase Hogan break for, like, five uh, Matthew Helshers or something like that, you know? Like, like, I know, I'm only worth, like, one of the five. So, whatever. We do those things. We do, you know, celebrate priests on Father's Day. You know, let them know. Make it normal. Priests have to be normal. They're not, they're not superheroes. They weren't born. That's one of the reasons my parents are here this, this week with me because I want them to be a witness to everyone else that I was not born a priest. I did not come out of the womb swinging a thurible. That's not the way it worked. And one thing that kept me away from the priesthood is that I didn't have gray hair and I wasn't old. I thought, how could I be a priest? It's the only thing I've ever seen. I thought, well, you have nothing to worry about. And so... 
there's so many things we have we have to we have to understand that um, we have to be formed. We have to know. And there's so many ideas in this book. I want to I want to read you something. Last last bit of hope right here. Page 51. The power of prayer. The mothers of Lou Italy. Have you ever heard of Lou Italy? I'm not either. We can never underestimate the power of prayer. In Lou Italy, a group of Catholic mothers were lamenting the lack of priests and religious in their small Italian village. Sound familiar? Are we lamenting the lack of... I was driving over here with the seminarian of your diocese. He was telling us how, how we're lacking seminarians. I know that. It's across the country. It's my diocese too. Everywhere. Parishes are going to close. Things are going to have to be consolidated. People, are, A priest is going to be serving five different churches at one time because that's just the way the times we live in. Are we lamenting? Here's the answer. The deepest desire of many of these mothers was for one of their sons to become a priest or for their daughter to place their life completely in God's service. Under the direction of the parish priest, Monsignor Alessandro Canora, they gathered every Tuesday for adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, asking the Lord for vocations. They also prayed for vocations after every single Mass. This is another thing that we're starting to do in our diocese. We just have holy hours for vocations. That's it. We're only praying for priestly vocations or religious vocations in our diocese. If that's what we need, that's what we're going to do. So around our diocese, every month, there's a different church in our diocese that hosts a holy hour for vocations, and anybody who wants goes there, and we, we beg the Lord to send us priests, laborers for the harvest. Listen here. In about 60 years, over one-third of Lou's population became priests or nuns. A third of the population. There were 323 religious who came from the town of less than 1,000 people. Between, and this isn't ancient, by the way, between 1881 and the 1940s. Some of our parents or grandparents lived in the 1940s, right? A third of the town's population became priests or religious. Through the power of prayer, these mothers, an atmosphere of delight in Christian devotion developed in the families and helped their children recognize that vocation their vocations more readily. Like the mothers of Lou, our ministry knew early that our weekly and monthly adoration for vocations would be instrumental in the efforts to bring about vocation-minded parish for the increasing vocations overall. Jesus is waiting to be asked. And he is truly present in the Eucharist. Encourage anyone in the diocese, any faithful in the diocese, to run to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and beg for workers for the harvest. It's the Lord who does the work. It's not you and I. That's why we don't have to fear. We just have to dispose ourselves. We have to pray. We have to allow Him to do His work. How many times does He say, knock, seek, ask, and do it fervently, and do it with all of your heart, giving everything to Him, and He will bring laborers for the harvest. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be. Lord God, amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen.